Good evening. You know, as we listen to the news, it uh, seems as though our, uh, with each and every passing day, it just seems that America is growing worse and worse. Um, there continues to be valid questions regarding the actions of some who are in positions of authority. There is most certainly vengeful retaliations that are being imposed upon those who are totally innocent. There continues to be racial tension and fires are constantly being stoked on a daily basis. But as we begin our study this evening, let it be very clear that every life matters. That every soul matters. Amen. And that's because Jesus tasted death for everyone. Hebrews chapter 2 in verse 9. And so the title of our lesson this evening is, How Did This Nation Get So Messed Up? And there is no question that the whole world, that certainly includes our very own nation, is filled with an appalling amount of evil. We are impacted by this reality every day, on every level, intellectually, physically, spiritually, socially. We're just impacted by it uh, in every category, every day. Thus, it's uh, not surprising that some people have a, a difficulty trying to reconcile this harsh reality with the idea of a all-good and all-powerful God. Well, a few weeks ago, we had a lesson entitled, In the Wake of Evil. And in that lesson, we explained why God, though He is all-good, though He is all-powerful, why God simply cannot intervene in every disaster. He cannot intervene every time evil is about to befall one of His children. And that is because when God created man, He created us with the ability, with the freedom, with the liberty to make our own decisions. And as we know, uh, decisions carry with them various consequences. But brethren and friends, if God were to interfere and prevent a bad decision, then there really was no decision to begin with. We would just be puppets at the end of a string. We'd just be mere robots. But that's not how God created us. Well, and we'll talk more about that in a future study, but it goes without saying that not everything in this world is good. Not everything in this world is beautiful, and not every person is happy. Uh, evil exists. It's a real reality. And as we ponder the question, how did this nation get so messed up, the answer is this, sin. <laughs> the answer is simply that. That's the right answer, and that's the easy answer. But it is sin, and all sin, and falls short of the glory of God, Romans 3 and in verse 23. Because when we sin, it brings with it consequences, and more often than not, uh, these consequences amount to evil in some way, form, or fashion. And the Bible defines sin as lawlessness in 1 John chapter 3 and in verse 4. So in essence, sin is any attitude or any action that is against God, against His will. That's very simplistic, but that is what it is. So where did sin start? Now, we can go back to Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 7, the inspired record reads, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place for them in heaven uh, found any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. 
Well, as you read that, certainly that was an attitude that led to an action that was against God. And by the simplistic definition, that would be sin. But the devil is, is a spiritual being. He's not a human being. And what we read in Revelation 12 took place in heaven, not on earth. So where does sin begin here on earth? Well, it goes back to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Sin began here on earth with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. We can see that there in the text. And, and how we can really put two and two together is this. The Bible says, or Paul said in Romans 6 and verse 23, For the wages of sin is death. And he says in his letter to Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and in verse 21, that for since by one man, which is in reference to Adam, for since by one man came death, he continues to say by man, which is Christ, also came the resurrection of the dead. There was no death prior to uh, uh, the sin of Adam and Eve. And sin came into the world at that time. Uh, there, and... And while sin started with Adam and Eve, it didn't stop with them. It continues uh, uh, in, in Romans three and in verse twenty. Uh, Romans three and in verse ten says, "There's none righteous, no, not one. We're all guilty of sin. There's not a single person on earth who is always good and never sins. There was one, but that was Jesus Christ. But He's not here now." There's not a, a person, there's not an individual on, on, on this earth that is always good and never sins. Now the question on the mind of many is this, and this is what we really want to focus on. Does the existence of evil argue against the existence of God? That's, that's what atheists will suggest, that's what skeptics suggest. That's what other critics of Christianity suggest. They argue against the existence of God on the basis of the existence of evil. And their argument is really simple. It's just this. If God is all good, then he opposes evil. If God is all powerful, then he can stop evil. And if God is all knowing, then he knows when sin is going to happen. He knows when evil is going to happen. And so when you have that combination, unbelievers claim, skeptics claim, atheists claim, critics of Christianity claim, that any combination of those three uh, leads us to a conclusion that since God does not stop evil when he is able, then God does not exist. Well, some will argue that God may exist, but that he's just simply too weak. Or that God exists, but he is, he's incompetent. He's maybe even evil himself. And there are some who have taken the discouraging position promoted by H.G. Wells, who said, faced with what we see around us in the world today, we're forced to conclude either God has the power and does not care, or God cares and does not have the power. We'll address that more so in another study. But for the purpose of our study tonight, does this prove, does the existence of evil prove that God does not exist? To the contrary. It proves just the opposite. It proves what they're saying it doesn't prove. The unbeliever's argument against the existence of God actually proves his existence. And think about it. If there is evil in the world, how then, how can we judge it to be evil? If there's evil, how can we know it's evil? You see, we can't judge anything to be good or evil unless there is an absolute standard of right and wrong. There has to be the existence of objective good. And the psalmist said in, one, in Psalm 136 verse 1 that God is good. He is the objective standard of good. Now, the Apostle Paul put it this way. For by the law, 
the law being the law of God, is the knowledge of sin. We see that in Romans chapter 3 and in verse 20. So real objective evil, which everyone claims it, it, it exists, since real objective evil exists, it proves that God himself exists. Now, evil exists, and this we know. And we know it exists because God exists. You can't tell me there's no way that you can say an act is good or evil without an objective standard of good, and God is the good. Now, since evil is present, and since evil is evident all around us, the question is, where is God? Where is God? God's where he's always been. Luke said in Acts 17 and in verse 27, he's not far from each one of us. God is where he's always been. But God will not force himself upon us. So let's think about how we as a nation got so messed up. And, and the, the point of, of our study this evening is to take a trip down the, the past 50 to 60 years. Just 50 to 60 years, in my opinion, a strong opinion can be made that our nation got so messed up when in 1962, the Supreme Court, by a vote of 6 to 1, ruled that children may not recite a state written prayer in school. Amen. That prayer is, Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon Thee, and we beg Thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. In 1962, by a vote of 6 to 1, it was ruled that children could not recite that prayer. And that decision paved the way for Madeleine Murray O'Hare, who in 1963 took a school board of Baltimore to court for allowing prayer in school. The Supreme Court, by a vote of 8 to 1, ruled in favor of abolishing school prayer and at the same time abolished reading the scriptures. They abolished Bible reading in all public schools. Now what's interesting here is a footnote on the O'Hare case. This case was centered around Madeline Murray O'Hare's son, William Murray. He was in junior high and his mother told him to write a log of what happened in school, what takes place each day at school. And Madeline would eventually remove William from school. And soon uh, you had NBC, CBS, ABC, and every other major newswire service calling to arrange an interview with Madeline and, Mil and William. And overnight, the school prayer issue became a national news story. And the rest is, of course, history. Now what's interesting here is about William. William, who grew up in this atheist environment, William saw the devastating effects that was happening in our schools when prayer was removed. And he would eventually become a preacher. And he would advocate for the restoration of freedom to pray anywhere, including public schools. And he would write a book. He wrote a book on the subject titled, let us pray a plea for prayer in our schools. In, in the book is a detailed account of this case. Also a very interesting section, listen, on how the communists removed school prayer. A movement in the works back in the 60s. Now back to the question, where is God? Friends, God is where we put Him. God is where we put Him. We've taken Him out of our schools. 
We've taken him out of the impressionable minds of our children. And, and what has resulted? A generation, a nation that is bent on evil. And, and what should we have expected? When we remove God and we remove the teaching of creation and replace it with the teaching of evolution, our kids, our children are made to believe that they're nothing more than mere animals. And in the animal kingdom, what is? Might makes right. And so people, man, we're just vulnerable prey to one another. Life carries no real meaning. Life carries no real value. That's the result of evolution. When you believe you're nothing more than an animal, then life carries no value, no meaning, no purpose. How important is God in Bible reading to our schools and thus to our nation? Abraham Lincoln said, the philosophy in the schoolroom in one generation will be the philosophy of government in the next. That, friends, is exactly what has happened. Look back at the history of God in schools, and, and, and as we do that, we're going to be able to see how this nation got so messed up. In 1620, you have the Mayflower Compact signed. And it, and it reads, Having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith, furtherance of the ends aforementioned, aforesaid. The pilgrims taught their children the Bible. And they taught their children the Christian faith. That's in 1620. In 1690, you have the first New England Primer published. And the alphabet is, is taught using Bible verses for each letter and has questions on Bible moral teachings. The primer contains children's prayers, the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, so on and so forth. The New England primer will be in wide use in American schools of all types, public, private, home, parochial, for the next 200 years. 1781, Congress approves the purchase of Bibles to be used in schools. 1783, first Noah Webster, a little blue book speller, is published. And here's its opening sentence declaring, no man may put off the law of God. This speller is widely used in American schools and is peppered throughout with scripture. Later versions stated, Noah Webster, who taught millions to read but no one to sin. 1787, Congress passed the Northwest Ordinance with, which outlines requirements for governments of new territories so that they can qualify for Article 3 uh, for, for statehood, statehood. Article 3 of the Northwest Ordinance directs the people of the territories to establish schools, listen, to establish schools to teach religion, to teach morality, to teach knowledge. Nearly every state admitted to the Union after this has written in their state constitution wording that the schools are to teach morality and religion and they all use the Bible as the basis of their teaching. 1802. Thomas Jefferson, acting as president for Washington, D.C. schools, requires the Bible to be used in classrooms. 1808. Washington's Farewell Address, published as a separate textbook. His address is looked upon as, as one of the most important political documents in American history. In the speech, Washington emphasizes that for America to succeed, it must have a moral society which can only come from roots in the Christian faith. And that textbook is used until the 1960s. 1844, the Supreme Court rules that American schools are to teach Christianity using the Bible. And in 1890, listen, 1890, put an asterisk there, 1890, the Supreme Court rules that America is a religious people and this is a Christian nation. 
And as such, it is fitting that his people would teach their children the Christian faith. In 1892, the Pledge of Allegiance is written for school children to recite at school. 1900, virtually all school textbooks published to date have contained biblical references or teachings. And then, 1600s to 1900, in 1925, Tennessee governor signs law forbidding the teaching of evolution in public schools, but the ACLU lawyers took a school district to court in the famous Scopes Monkey Trial in an effort to have evolution taught in Tennessee public schools. They failed, but the deterioration was beginning. In 1948, Supreme Court rules that time set aside for prayer in public schools is unconstitutional. Then there's a glimmer of hope. In 1954, the words one nation under God are added to the Pledge of Allegiance. But then we start to spiral. 1962, the Supreme Court rules that children cannot recite a state written prayer in school. 1963, Supreme Court bans individual school prayer and Bible reading in public schools. 1965, Supreme Court rules that a child, <laughs> a child may pray to himself if no one knows he is praying and his lips are not moving. 1980, Supreme Court rules that the Ten Commandments cannot be posted in classrooms. Get this. For a child might read them, reflect upon them, and then obey them. And then in 2000, the Supreme Court rules that student-initiated or student-led prayers at football games is unconstitutional. Friends, it's my opinion, and that's what it is. It's my opinion that the decisions, these recent decisions made by the Supreme Court have done more to turn our nation away from God than any other branch of government. And not only is this an election year, this is a year that we'll be electing a president, but we're also awaiting one to be appointed to the Supreme Court. When you look at the history, and you've seen some of the decisions made and how it has turned us away from God, not closer to Him. We need people on the, on the Supreme Court who are going to lead us back to God in the Scriptures. We need to be praying for this nation. We need to be praying for the upcoming election. We need to be praying for the right appointments into the Supreme Court. History has proven that. It's imperative that we, we pray and we do our careful, careful research before casting our vote. What has the, the impact been of removing prayer from school? David Barton of Wall Builders has studied the statistical record for the past 60 years. In each study, you can clearly see a negative impact starting around the year 1962 when school prayer was removed. Teenage pregnancy rates have gone up 500%. The unmarried mothers has risen dramatically. The divorce rate is so high that many young children don't really understand what a family is. Violent crimes have risen steadily since the early 60s and our prison system uh, is bursting at the seams. Government records show the effect of removing school prayer. Here are the top seven leading problems in our schools, ranked in order from first to seventh in 1940 and in 1990. In 1940, the number one problem was talking out of turn. In 1990, it was drug abuse. Number two, in 1940, the biggest problem was chewing gum. Number two, in 1990, 
is alcohol abuse. In 1940, number three is making noise. Number three in 1990 is pregnancy. Number four in 1940 is running in the halls. Number four in 1990 is suicide. Number five in 1940 is cutting in line. Number five in 1990 is rape. Number six in 1940 is dress code violations. In 1990, number six is robbery. In 1940, the number seven problem was littering. And number seven in 1990 is assault. Brethren, this is what history has unfolded. This is the result of taking God out of the classroom. Of taking God out of the minds of impressionable children. As we draw to a close, it's not hard to understand how this nation got so messed up. It might not be long before an argument, maybe even a strong argument, can be made. Maybe it's in the process of being made now that, that, there, has never been, that there has never been in the history of mankind a more sinful people. And I know it was so bad in Genesis chapter 6, there was a great flood. And I know it was bad in, in Corinth. And I know there were bad empires and bad nations, bad countries. But I think we're starting to make an argument of just how bad we are as a nation. And the fact that God simply hasn't wiped our nation off the planet of the earth is, is a testament to His, His grace and His mercy. It's a testament to His long-suffering. God has richly blessed our nation. And, 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 and while no people will ever be without sin, for the most part, our nation as a whole was one that feared Almighty God. We saw that. One that, that uh, accepted biblical truth. We saw that. And we wonder how we became great. Go back to how we believed in the Bible and how we believed in the Christian faith. And then it all began to change 50 to 60 years ago. In the last five to six decades, we've gone from a nation that revered God and honored biblical truth to a nation that has rejected God and His truth. We've gone from having public schools that taught moral principles, good citizenship with high scholastic, scholastic achievements, to schools that now what? have disrespect for authority. Sex, drugs, anger, knives, guns, murder, low SAT scores, no moral teachings, no mention of God. And we're surprised how we declined as a nation. Brethren and friends, the fix to our problem is God. The fix to our problem is a return to the Bible. Amen. This is how we got so messed up. Brethren and friends, I hope and pray that... I know I'm speaking to those in this assembly that, that have a good, basic, fundamental understanding. But we need to know, we need the world to know how this nation got so messed up, and how this nation can be great again and, and, and back to where she was in the beginning. And again, that's God and, and the Bible. This time we extend the invitation to those in this assembly. Brethren and friends, if you have a need of any kind, perhaps there are some this, this evening who not yet put on Christ in baptism, we want you to know that opportunity is available. And if you are God's child, you stray from the faith, repent, confess, and be restored. May every soul... Walk out the doors of this building this evening, right with God and ready for our Lord's return. Brethren and friends, if you have a need of any kind, we encourage you to come forward as together we stand and together we sing.